Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's my very great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, special uh, meeting in this symposium where we have uh, the great honor of having Thomas Jordan, who is the governor of the, uh, or the chairman of the governing board of the Swiss National Bank uh, with us. Uh, Professor Jordan has a very distinguished record as an academic in the field of monetary theory and policy. He joined the central bank 18 years ago, then ran STAB Fund, which was there to deal with the fallout from the financial crisis. And since 2012, he has been uh, the chairman of the governing board. I have a great affection for the Swiss National Bank because when I was a young academic, I was in exactly the same field, uh, and I did research particularly on the money supply. And in the early 1970s, the only central bank in the world that was targeting the monetary base was the Swiss National Bank. And I developed a very strong relationship with the National Bank. Thomas, it's a great pleasure having you here tonight. I know that in Switzerland, I know that in Switzerland, you're, you're not always the most liked person. <laughs> in fact, I read this newspaper comment which horrified me, which said you were the most hated man in the foreign exchange market. Um, but uh, I'd like to come, if I may, uh, this is a dialogue, and, and um, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd like to come to the, to the, the, the question uh, which is, we've been asked to discuss. Uh, which is the following. In the long run, the Swiss National Bank's decision to discontinue the minimum exchange rate of Swiss francs 120 to the euro in favor of a free float will pay off for Switzerland's economy, yes or no? That's the question we have to discuss. So can I put it to you? <laughs> <coughs> Well, thank you very much, Brian, for inviting me. It's really an honor to be here, and I'm very happy uh, to have the possibility to discuss all those issues. Well, I have to say the decision of the 15th of January was a very difficult one to take. We knew that it has a big impact on, uh, on the Swiss economy, but uh, we also realized that given the change in the international environment, the minimum exchange rate, change rate that served Switzerland well for three and a half years became unsustainable. And once we realized that the uh, minimum exchange rate is not, in, not anymore sustainable, we had to change this policy and we had to take uh, this decision. Any postponing of the decision would have made the situation worse and it would also not be responsible. So it would have been, in our view, irresponsible once we knew that that policy has to be changed only to wait, only to increase the balance sheet, uh, to increase the negative impact later on on the Swiss economy. So when we considered that, we came to the conclusion it's much, much better to take the decision immediately and then to announce it. Although, obviously, in the short run, it has a negative impact now on Switzerland yeah. because the Swiss franc is overvalued. It's a very strong Swiss franc, with, uh, in the short run, at least, this negative impact also on growth. Can, can I just say, in case people haven't read it, I, uh, because I, in, as a professional, I used to be a monetary economist. The, the statement that you made on the 24th of January to, I think, the annual shareholders meeting of the bank, it's an outstanding statement by uh, Thomas on the reasons that they took the difficult decision uh, in January. Can I just ask you, uh, if I was now on the other side of the fence to you, uh, and I was dealing in the foreign exchange market and so on, or I, if I was a Swiss businessman, um, were you able or are you able today to set any rules or to tell people what are the sort of landmarks that you take into account in making the decision of when to intervene and when not to intervene in the market? Well, we said very, very clearly that uh, we continue to look at the foreign exchange market. 
We look at overall, not one specific currency, but the overall situation. We consider the Swiss franc still as significantly overvalued. And in case there's a necessity to intervene in the foreign exchange market, we will do that in order to have an impact also on the monetary conditions in, in Switzerland. This is what we said uh, since this uh, uh, decision on January 15th, and we follow this uh, rule since then. Because you're saying if you hadn't taken the decision, no. which you did on January the 15th, because people wanted to buy Swiss francs, money comes into Switzerland, you have to monetize that, and the outlook for inflation would be made very much worse if you had not acted. Hmm. Well, the, or is that too simple? <laughs> well, it's probably a little bit too simple. So the, the fact you is... See, you can see he's yeah. a superior monetary economist to me. Yeah. <laughs> I doubt that, but... No, uh, no. Um, in, indeed, it's a, it's a very complex situation. So it, we had this uh, change in the international environment, the divergence between monetary policy in the United States and Europe. And altogether, that put an enormous pressure on the, on the Swiss franc. Not with an immediate threat to inflation in Switzerland. We had uh, zero inflation environment. And indeed, now it's, it's even uh, uh, slightly negative inflation. But the, uh, the fact is that we realized that it will be unsustainable to continue with this policy. And it's not a question whether we can maintain it forever. But it was a question whether we should stop it now or to stop it in one month, three months, or six months. And we had to compare the consequences of changing the policy in January 15 or changing it later on. And this comparison then led us to the conclusion that it's, although it's a very difficult uh, situation, although it's hurting the Swiss economy in the short run, it's better to do it in January instead of waiting until you are completely behind the curve and the negative consequences for the country, for the markets, and for the bank uh, will be much bigger. So if you need surgery, better to get it done quickly than to delay? In a way, yes. No. Sorry, I don't want to put words in your mouth. No. Um, can I just ask you, I, I was reading somewhere, uh, you've taken a loss in terms of the, um, the, the, the devaluation of assets on your balance sheet. To what extent, when you decide on an exchange rate or to change the exchange rate, to what extent do you take the equity value of the central bank into account? Well, as a central bank, we have to be ready to take risk on our balance sheet in order to have an influence on monetary conditions. We did that in the past. If you look at the balance sheet of the Swiss National Bank, it's, it's very big. We have close to 100% of annual GDP. This is more than 500 billion on the balance sheet. So we were always ready to take risks on the balance sheet. As long as we were convinced that this risk, or the risk taking, is really worth to take it. And, uh, but when you know that uh, even an extending of the balance sheet, a uh, big increase of the balance sheet, will not yield any benefit, then I guess it's not warranted to take or, or, to, or to accept an uh, extension mm. of the balance sheet. So we have to make this fine distinction. We have to take risk if it's necessary. We should not shy away to take risk as long as we are convinced that it's necessary to have the necessary influence on monetary conditions. But when you know that the policy is not sustainable, then to increase the balance sheet almost with no reward mm. for, for Switzerland, no reward for monetary conditions in the medium term, then I guess it's really ir ir irresponsible to take this additional risk. Yeah. If you make profits on your balance sheet, who benefits? Well, <coughs> you have a very clear rule in Switzerland. So when it's not only profit. If the capital, to make it very simple, is big enough, if the capital is above the targeted capital, then we make an annual distribution of our profits, a transfer from the, central, from the Swiss National Bank to the cantons and to the federal government. Right. But this is always limited. So it does not depend on the annual result, but rather it's then smoothed over time. But as soon as the capital situation is not good enough. If the, the capital is below the targeted capital, then it's no transfer to the cantons or the government. But the cantons and the federal government have a direct interest in you making a profit on the balance sheet. 
in the way yes. So I don't want to embarrass yeah. you, but yeah. no, I no. can see in Britain this would be, you know, yeah. it creates tension. Well, there are no, well, obviously the cantons, they have an interest that the Swiss National Bank is paying the dividend or, or the, the, the profit transfer. But the key point is it has no influence on monetary yes. policy decisions. So neither in the past nor in the future nor in the present, those kinds of reflection had any impact on actual monetary uh, uh, decisions. So, so we knew or we know that this is uh, something, a uh, delicate issue, yeah. but it's, it's clear that it has no impact really on, on monetary uh, uh, policy decision. That was true for the past, but it will be true also for the present and the future. Can I just say, I felt that's a very important principle at stake, that the fiscal position of either the central government or of local governments should not dictate monetary policy. Monetary policy should really be conducted to have stable prices or a stable low rate of inflation and continued growth. That's what one is aiming for. Is that right? Exactly. So this is also the, uh, the, the principal mandate of the Swiss mm. National Bank to conduct a policy that ensures price stability over time. Mm. Always it's more difficult, sometimes it's easier but uh, we should uh, maintain or conduct a policy that is able to deliver price stability in the medium to long term. Mm. Can I just ask you, uh, when the, uh, um, the Swiss franc appreciated, clearly exporters found it mm. painful and difficult and so on. Uh, what is the good news you could tell them this evening? <laughs> well, I have to say it's really for the Swiss economy in general, but especially for those uh, who have to export, it's a very difficult situation. And we have great respect for, for all the, the firms, but also for the employees who have now to deal with this very de delicate situation. They have to do a lot of efforts. It's a great challenge. So we have a great respect from this situation. Uh, in the past, we had several times similar situations, sometimes bigger, sometimes smaller. But the Swiss economy in the past always was capable to deal with those kind of uh, uh, shocks, exchange rate shocks, where the Swiss franc appreciated. Uh, most of the time, it was, uh, the economy was able to co cope with that, to cope with the, the situation. Sometimes it's more, more difficult. It's never for sure, so th that's why also uh, we have great respect uh, for the challenge. But uh, we assume that uh, now it's a great effort of the economy, so together with the employees, it will also possible this time to adjust to this new situation. I guess what, what is the important point is, it was not uh, a decision to just avoid an appreciation of the Swiss franc. It was only a decision to do it in January or later on. So for the economy, it's, it's very important to realize this, uh, this kind of trade-off and this kind of situation. So from the point of view of an exporter, if you had delayed mm. and speculative balances were coming into Switzerland, the problem they would have faced would have been greater the longer you delayed. In my view, yes. So, so the longer we waited, the bigger the problem uh, becomes, the bigger the balance sheet, the bigger the, the uh, impact, the negative impact on financial markets, and the bigger the negative impact on the Swiss economy. Mm -hmm. And the bigger the negative impact on the, uh, on the Swiss National Bank to conduct monetary policy in the future. So today, the the Swiss National Bank is in a different position compared to one where we had invested for nothing again 500, or a, uh, 500 billion or a trillion. Mm. I, I wonder if you could give us some idea because I feel uh, those of us who are not actively involved in central banking like yourself at present, I mean, you, you just look at the state of the world. You know, we've had a financial crisis. We have a crisis in, in the Ukraine. We have the position in Russia. We have problems in the Middle East. We have volatility in the oil price. We have commodity prices which have moved. What's it like being a central banker in this world with so much uncertainty? Well, this is the life of a central banker. <laughs> we, cannot we cannot choose the environment. <coughs> if I compare the situation that uh, existed before the financial crisis, obviously, it's, it's much more difficult and uh, not any more as, as comfortable as it is today, but uh, th this is life. And uh, every central bank got a mandate from parliament in Switzerland, even from the people through the constitution. 
and uh, we, we have to do the best that we can fulfill this mandate to, to conduct the monetary policy in, in the uh, general interest of, of the country. And we mm. cannot complain about the environment. This environment uh, for a small open economy is here, and we have to, to deal with that and to try uh, to, do, to make the best mm. out of it. But uh, we cannot change it. Mm. But obviously, it is uh, something that makes it much more difficult compared to a situation where we had uh, low volatility, great moderation, mm. no, no uh, financial crisis, mm. etc. So it's, it's very, very different. And if you look at the uh, decisions that are now taken by, by central banks worldwide, they are much more extreme than, than they used to be. And mm. th obviously, this is really as, as, uh, the result of this very, very difficult situation yeah. globally. Mm. Can I ask you uh, how, I mean, two questions really in one, well, two parts of one question. One is, uh, as an ac if I were now an academic economist, I would have real reservations about the sustainability of the euro, mm. because you've put so much emphasis within the euro area on adjustment other than through the exchange rate. Uh, and I just wonder, I mean, to what extent do you think the euro in its present form is sustainable over the medium term? And in the light of that, do you see real problems from a Greek exit, were it to happen? Well, oh, it's a very <coughs> difficult question, but I guess all these discussions are, uh, are really uh, relatively far away from reality. So the euro exists since 19... I'm being an academic yeah. now, am I? Yeah. It's an European project, it's a reality, and it will not disappear. This is a reality, and they conduct monetary policy, and uh, uh, for, for that, from the, that perspective, it will uh, be here, and it's, a, it's the currency of the European Union. So this is really linked together. And uh, to a large extent, the monetary policy of the European Central Bank was very successful, given all the difficulties that exist uh, mm -hmm. in, in Europe. The, uh, Greece is a real, it's a real uh, risk and, uh, and a very difficult situation. I can only uh, make a judgment from, from our Swiss perspective. Uh, I guess all the, the difficulties that would arise with an Brexit should not be underestimated. It, in our views, it would have a, an impact on financial markets and would rather increase than decrease vol volatility. And the Greek currency could, uh, sorry, the Swiss currency could be a safe haven if there was yeah. more volatility. Of course, the Swiss uh, franc is a safe haven. And yes. every time we have uncertainty, an increase in uncertainty, when we have a geopolitical risk that is materializing, Obviously, that puts uh, the Swiss franc uh, on, on the pressure. You know, I'm now going to open the discussion to others. Uh, when I asked somebody uh, uh, at the beginning of uh, this conference symposium, I said, I have to chair the session with Thomas Jordan. What should I do? And they said, introduce him and run. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> Is it I'm so not, dangerous? I'm not running. I'm yeah. staying next yeah. to you, okay. Thomas. Very uh, but I'd like to now throw it open to yourselves, because this yeah. is a rare occasion to be able to um, question a, a central banker. Gentlemen at the back there. Um, what are the actual problems with having an excessively large central bank balance sheet? I mean, why, why is it not sustainable? What would you anticipate happening if it had carried on growing? Very good question. No. <clears throat> well, I said the, poli the policy of maintaining a minimum exchange rate of 120 vis-a-vis -vis or, or against Europe was not sustainable. The question about the size of the balance sheet is an important one and uh, a relatively difficult one also to answer. The, the, the balance sheet itself um, is not the problem, and we can also extend the balance sheet. But I said, what I said before, when we extend the balance sheet, the value we get for that has to be big enough in order to take the risk. And if you increase the balance sheet all the time, you have a couple of problems. One is how you conduct monetary policy later, and how do you normalize monetary policy. So these are the issues and facts that you have to, to be clear about before you are ready to expand the balance sheet in really uh, territories that were never tested before. So it's relatively easy to talk about uh, 
of the balance sheet in a very theoretical way, but we have to see in reality those dimensions of balance sheet of central bank were ne never tested before, and so we have to be also careful, careful about that. Gentleman just here. The one with the taller arm. Mm. You. Um, thank you very much. Um, I was just wondering if you could clarify, um, first of all, why the PEG was introduced. Because we have seen that uh, quantitative easing as a tool, at least in the short run, works. But many countries have tried that without like, pursuing a fixed exchange rate policy. What was the primary goal of doing that? And back when, like in the day when you were introducing this, were you not thinking about the potential consequences of, at some point in time, uh, canceling the pact, basically? Yeah. Thank you. Well, it was from clear from the beginning that the minimum exchange rate, it is not the peg, or was not the peg, it was the minimum exchange rate, is a temporary and extraordinary measure, not something permanent. So it was only for a, a limited time uh, considered. Now, before we introduced the minimum exchange rate, we tried to increase the liquidity in the market, in, in, in Swiss franc market, by injecting enormous amount of, of liquidity, but the impact on the exchange rate was not sufficient. And given the fact that we have a very small domestic bond market, it was not possible to do a quantitative easing similar to the US or, or the, uh, the ECB. And then we came to the conclusion that it's better to have a direct impact on the exchange rate, so this minimum exchange rate. From the beginning, we knew that one day the exit will be an issue and it will come. I have also to say that it lasted longer than we expected because we thought that this will be something uh, for a relatively short period of time. It was also the, the view that the situation globally and worldwide will normalize sooner and it will normalize in a direction that will have uh, a better economic conditions worldwide, but especially also in Europe, and that now changed in the, in, in the other direction. But the, 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 the question about how the exit will, uh, will have to be managed was something that obviously uh, we ask ourselves and, and we, we made reflections from the beginning. And unfortunately, the situation did not improve, but at the end, it changed in the other direction, so we had to take an exit at the point where the minimum exchange rate was binding. The, most e the much easier situation would have been when the minimum exchange rate would have been com completely obsolete. That was the case when the Swiss National Bank did something similar in the late 1970s. Yeah. Gentlemen, just here. Good evening. Uh, my name is Girish, and I'm from India. Uh, I know it's a little unusual to bring in a human element when we're talking about money, but I was just wondering, uh, you took a decision which you believe has averted a possible disaster, but uh, it is something that, because it has been averted, will never come into reality, and therefore it's very hard to prove. And w how, how, I mean, how was it for you to take a decision like this? Because it could be an unsung heroic story. I hope I'm clear. Yeah, yeah. No, no, you're very, very clear. Very clear. <laughs> very clear. <laughs> very clear. Well, Can I, I say, I'd love to answer the question, <laughs> because I lived through it in the UK no. when we ended up with a, a, a rate of inflation of 30%, because we didn't take the action in terms of, in this case, raising interest rates at the right time. But anyway, it's, no. Thomas is the person to answer it, not me. Well, it, it's a very good question. And, uh, I have to say it was not an easy decision to take. And uh, it's not a decision by myself, it's a decision of the governing board of the Swiss National Bank and supported by our staff that helped us uh, to come to this kind of conclusion. But it was a very difficult uh, decision to take because we knew that it ha will have a big impact first on financial markets and later on on the Swiss e economy and it will uh, be very difficult for, for, uh, for, for many <coughs> people in, in, in the Swiss economy. But the, the, the key point was that uh, when you are in a such position where you have to take decisions, you have to come to a conclusion and at the end of the day, you have to be able 
capable and ready to take a, de a decision. When you, have, when you fear to take a decision and you postpone every decision only because you are afraid of the negative echo in the press or the uh, negative uh, discussion the next day, I guess uh, th then you should not be at this, at this position. So, so we were really aware of the fact that th that will be very controversial. But we, we had to, to really set up on the table all the positive and negative points and then uh, to take the balance of, of those points and then we came to the conclusion that this is, is the, better t uh, uh, the, the better decision to take it on January 15 than to postpone it. And although we, we were very <coughs> clear uh, for ourselves that that will have uh, uh, in, in the short term this, this, uh, this uh, impact. I wonder, Thomas, if I can ask you a question, just to clarify something. You know, this could become a very technical discussion because it's a very technical subject. And we talk about pegs and floors and intervention now, not intervention then, and so on. But if I can ask you, I mean, you are concerned with monetary policy. The well-being of the Swiss people depends on inflation or, or, or the absence of inflation and on the real growth of the economy. The ultimate purpose of what you're doing is you're not just fiddling monetary things for the sake of fiddling them. You are interested ultimately in the, the well-being of the whole economy and what you're doing. And I wonder if you could just say how you see what you are doing in a very technical area, ultimately improving the general welfare of the Swiss people. This is quite a complex question to, to answer in, in, in two senses, but let, let me say one important point. We have also to see that monetary policy <coughs> is something that has an impact on the economy, not only today, but tomorrow, after tomorrow, in one or two <coughs> years. So sometimes you have to take a decision that uh, may not be considered as optimal in the very short uh, term, mm. but is much better in the medium to long term. So in, in order to <coughs> avoid the negative inflation in January, the decision was probably not optimal. Mm. But to maintain the capability of the Swiss National Bank to conduct monetary policy at the end of this year, next year, and in two years, it was the much better, uh, the much better decision. So this is the complexity, and this is also the difficulty in communication, that sometimes you have to accept a certain volatility in mm. the short run, in order to be able to conduct and to achieve your mandate in the medium yes. to, to long, long term. Yeah. To destroy the capability of the Swiss National Bank to conduct monetary policy only to have a little bit less negative inflation in January mm. would be completely crazy. Mm. So you have to mm. see or to consider the, the, mm. the means, the, the instruments, the capability of, mm. of the institution of the bank in or the medium to, to, long, to long term. Now, coming back to your question, I, I think the, the, the key contribution of the Swiss National Bank is really to maintain price stability over the medium to long term and to take economic fluctuations in, into account. Sometimes you have these huge shocks on the, globally that hit the Swiss economy, and to some extent it's possible to absorb those, uh, those shocks through monetary uh, instruments or monetary means. Sometimes it's not possible because of the mm. size of those, those shocks. But this is something that we can include, but o only to a certain extent. And uh, surely what is not possible is that uh, monetary policy will have a permanent impact <coughs> on, on the growth rate of Switzerland. Uh, this is something that is something sometimes uh, <coughs> believed in, especially abroad. <coughs> But monetary policy cannot do all these kind of, uh, uh, of goals that are not really linked to, to, to the key point of monetary okay. policy. I, I should add, this is just an aside, but uh, when I was the head of the policy unit in 10 Downing Street, Mrs. Thatcher, I went and looked one day, I remember it distinctly, uh, we were intervening in the foreign exchange markets in Britain in order to shadow the Deutsche Mark. But people, because they thought the economy was doing very well, they wanted to buy pounds. As a result, the extent the Bank of England had to intervene, exactly like your situation, was, was proving a disaster. And I remember on a Friday morning going to see the Prime Minister, I wrote her a, a single small paragraph 
and said, Prime Minister, I think this policy, we just have to let the rate go. And I said, I've gone to speak to the head of the Treasury, but not the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Uh, and I, I rang the director of the Bank of England, Eddie George, who then became the governor. And she said to me, I totally agree with you. And by Monday morning, it had gone. If we hadn't done it, we would have built up the inflationary pressure, which would have, in the medium term, been a disaster for the economy. There's a gentleman back there. Uh, Phil O'Reilly from uh, New Zealand, another small developed economy with a vastly overpriced currency. <laughs> um, I represent business in New Zealand, and, and this may sound counter countercultural to you. <coughs> We were all a bit surprised you did it in the first place uh, because it was inevitable again to end in tears when you, when you withdrew it. Uh, we've had these debates in New Zealand over the years and basically the business community in my country has come to a pretty clear consensus that the best idea is just to leave the dollar to float and, and, and sometimes it'll be overvalued, sometimes undervalued. The problem we, we see when, when our Reserve Bank might do the same as you is, is it'll be a shock on the way in, mm. it might be a pleasant shock, but it'll be a shock on the way out, and we'd rather just have the markets operating as the markets operate. Mm. The other thing we say in New Zealand is the Reserve Bank needs mates, needs friends. And that's the point you were just making about really getting on and concentrating on the competitiveness of the economy, microeconomic reform, making sure that trade is open and, and all those sorts of things. Because if we concentrate too much on monetary policy, <coughs> we're going to have a problem with overall business competitiveness. So my question is, knowing now what you know, would you do it again, or, or, have you, or have you found that, that maybe it's a good idea not to do this kind of intervention in the economy? And let me say, if you were the New Zealand Reserve Bank governor, sitting there, I would have said, you shouldn't have done it in the first place. <laughs> well, I do not fully agree uh, with, with that. Well, we have to see that in uh, 2011, when we introduced uh, the minimum exchange rate, we had an extreme situation. So we just came out of the great... Uh, uh, the Great Recession and the financial crisis. And the economy worldwide, the global economy, was still in a very fragile situation. Demand was very low. And the Swiss franc started to appreciate like crazy. So we went from 160 against uh, vis a vis the, do uh, the euro to parity in a short, uh, very short period of time. And then the introduction of the minimum <coughs> exchange rate helped at least. Uh, to stop this appreciation for some time. As I said before, at that point of time, obviously the, the clear view was that we will see a normalization uh, because the Swiss franc was overvalued. It's still, as I said before, really significantly overvalued ag again today. So the three years of the minimum exchange rate gave uh, at least some relief to the Swiss economy to adjust to this huge appreciation that it's offered uh, during that time. And it was possible. It was not easy, but for, for many of the firms, at least partially to adjust to this new si situation. And from that perspective, I'm convinced that it was worthwhile to, to have this uh, minimum, uh, minimum exchange rate. But it's clear, the normal situation is obviously the floating exchange rate, sometimes stronger, sometimes uh, uh, weaker. The, the big question is obviously when you have these extreme cases where you have not only some of overvaluation or some undervaluation where you have significantly overvalued currency. And this is something that is obviously now also making uh, difficulties for this, for this Swiss economy. Uh, is there a lady whose hand is up? Okay. Yes, over there. Hi, um, I am from Austria, a country with a lot of debt in Swiss francs. And especially the, the city of Vienna overnight lost about 300 million in euros. And, um, but the vice mayor of Vienna would not admit that this is just speculation, what they were doing in the past, because they said, well, in the past we just profited from it. So what would you say to those, um, first of all, to those politicians? Would you say to them, just admit that you're speculating? And the second question is, what do you say to the, to the other communities who are now having problems, debt problems, because they were holding Swiss franc debt? And um, do you know um, about how other communities are dealing with it? Two questions. Yeah. 
Well, I will not comment about the politicians in Austria. I guess this is... <laughs> <laughs> Well, this is a phenomenon that exists a long time. So it started in Austria <laughs> with uh, the workers uh, who worked in Switzerland. They started to have mortgages in Swiss franc. Then it became a business model for Austria, then for Hungary, then for Poland. So we have this, uh, and even Germany, some cities also had Swiss franc uh, mortgages or, or, or debt. And uh, this is a phenomenon that is, is long known also the financial stability risks that are associated with, uh, with those debt. But this is primarily an issue for the countries uh, like Austria, Hungary, Poland, and Germany, and the authority there. So those uh, uh, cities or uh, people who had mortgages in Swiss, in Swiss franc, they knew that they have also an exchange rate risk. They profited from lower rates, and they had to really compare the lower rates with the higher risk and in order to make th those decisions. This is an uh, individual decision. Everybody who is capable to bear the risk should have the opportunity. We do not neither give advice, nor do we say that that should not be possible. This, this is really something that everybody has to decide uh, the, them, themselves. Now, given the huge appreciation of the Swiss franc for many of those who have the, the Swiss franc debt, obviously it's, it was not, not, not the best trade. But, uh, the, uh, but, but this risk should, should, have been, should have been known. This is all I can, can say, and uh, this is uh, usually treated in the country uh, itself where it is a problem. Gentlemen there. Uh. Uh. I'm Ludo from South Africa. Prof, you make a good argument why you didn't act later. Um, my question is, why didn't you use central bank communication moral suasion to act earlier and warn economies so that the shock wouldn't be that bad? Yeah. Well, that's a very good question because uh, this question was also asked in the public uh, in Switzerland. Why did we not inform the public or, or the, the markets in advance? Uh, why did we not use so-called forward guidance for this kind of uh, change in policy? And the answer is very simple. <coughs> forward guidance is a potentially good instrument if you would like to have an impact on long-term rates, interest rates. So by only use changing short-term rates and using forward guidance at the same time, you can influence the shape of the yield curve and through that, increase the impact <clears throat> on monetary policy. If your main instrument is on the exchange rate, then you cannot use this instrument. This is either <coughs> one or zero or black or white. So it's really up to the last second that you have to defend the floor or, or the minimum exchange rate, and then you change the policy. Any, any signal in advance to, uh, that the, this policy may be changed will immediately lead to massive speculation against, uh, against the Swiss National Bank and change the policy immediately. So if you signal that you will uh, increase or decrease the, the, or, or uh, discontinue the minimum exchange rate, then you, uh, ju just a signal will change the policy. So th this kind of instrument is not possible for, for this kind of uh, pos policy. There's a gentleman here, yes. Mm. Thank you. I'm Gyan from India. So uh, <coughs> central banks around the world have mainly three types of work. Like uh, may, uh, these are like uh, controlling inflation, controlling the foreign exchange rates, <coughs> and failing growth. I know in Switzerland you don't have pressure from the government on failing growth, but you can have pressure from the government on uh, in uh, on controlling inflation, right? So before you took the decision, you knew that the Swiss franc was going to appreciate and this would reduce the monetary flow which has resulted into a deflation which is negative inflation of minus one uh, of 1.1 percent in Switzerland. So didn't you face any friction from the government over this decision? Thank you. Can you repeat the last question? Didn't, didn't Did you face any friction with, from the government with, uh, with respect to this decision? <coughs> because in India we are all we always have this friction between the Reserve Bank of India and the central government because they differ on issues of inflation and failing growth. Yeah. 
Thank you. Yeah. Well, the, the Swiss National Bank is completely independent, so uh, we have a very intense di dialogue with the, with the government about economic issues, monetary policy, etc. But the, the, the decisions are taken by the, by the Swiss National Bank are, are the responsible responsibility of the Swiss National Bank. And I can say, say that really in, in Switzerland, the, uh, the governance of this independence is really well respected uh, by every player, uh, the parliament, the government, and the Swiss National Bank. So we really play against uh, exactly along the lines of this, uh, of this governance. This is a very delicate balance yeah. between the independence of the central bank and the fact you have to relate to the finance minister. Mm. Um, but I think it's true to say, is it not, that over the last 10, 20, 30 years, more and more central banks have moved to independence mm -hmm. because that is the only way they can control inflation. Well, in my view, independence is, is very important, but independence uh, means that you need a clear mandate, mm -hmm. a mandate where uh, you have, like in Switzerland, it's the general interest of the country and price stability. These are, in a way, two levels that mm -hmm. goes uh, or define the mandate. And you need the accountability so that you have to explain the decisions. We do that uh, uh, in Switzerland by an annual accountability report that we also present to the parliament. And we have an extensive uh, dialogue with, with the government about the economic mm. issues. Mm. But this is very important that you not only have the independence, but also the mandate and the accountability mm. to fulfill the mandate. We have time for one last question. Uh, the person... Uh, at the back, the lady at the back. I think it's a lady. Uh, yes, it is a lady. Yep. Very no, good. I'm Martina from Italy. I'm curious to hear your view. Who on are you? Sorry. Martina from Italy. Great. Okay. Uh, I'm curious to hear your view on ultra low monetary policy in the eurozone. Uh, we, it seems we are uh, seeing the same situation that we had before the crisis. So uh, extremely low interest rates uh, at the public level which are actually stimulating uh, taking up debts and are not taking into account the fundamental uh, structural situation of the countries. So what do you think uh, this is going to Well, I cannot really comment on the policy of the European uh, Central Bank. That is, uh, usually central banks do not comment about uh, each other's policy, but uh, something, I guess, in the... That's the rules of the club. <laughs> The rules of the club. The club, you don't yeah, comment on. But uh, a, a point that is also stressed by our colleagues in, in Frankfurt all the time is that structural reforms are extremely important in, in Europe so that monetary policy cannot solve all the problems. Mm. So in order to increase growth, in, mm. in order to become more competitive, Europe has to uh, do more structural reforms in, in different <coughs> countries. And I think this is a very important, uh, a very important point. Mm. Can I say on, on that point, if I can just draw this to a close, um, <clears throat> I think the task of a central banker today is probably the most difficult task of almost anyone in public life because people have put so much weight on monetary policy and it's a weight monetary policy can't bear. You know, interest rates are down to zero and now they're in negative territory. And we're trying to use interest rates and monetary policy as an alternative to structural reforms in the labor market or on the supply side or infrastructure development and so on. And monetary policy is just being asked to do far too much. In addition to that, given the uncertainties of today's world, which are extraordinary, whether they're political uncertainties or economic uncertainties, uh, the potential of further crises and so on, a central banker, I mean, it's a, it's a bit like sailing a yacht and going out on the ocean, on, 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 say, the Atlantic, and not knowing what the weather is going to be like. And it, it's a huge responsibility and a huge task. And I think for us this evening uh, in the uh, symposium, to have Thomas come along and be so open and be prepared to be quizzed by all of us, my feeling is that he's done an outstanding job as the central bank governor of the Swiss National Bank. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Brian. That was terrific. Thank you. 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 Thank Ladies and gentlemen, I'm just delighted to know that you agree with me. <laughs> can, I, can I just say, I was told by the organizers to say, don't move, the, the show will continue. Thank you very much.